Ulysses by James Joyce, Episode 4, Calypso, read by Alex Tamulus. Mr. Leopold Bloom ate with relish the inner organs of beasts and fowls. He liked thick giblet soup, nutty gizzards, a stuffed roast heart, liver slices fried with crust crumbs, fried hand-cods rose. Most of all, he liked grilled mutton kidneys, which gave to his palate a fine tang of faintly scented urine. Kidneys were in his mind as he moved about the kitchen softly, riding her breakfast things on the humpy tray. Jalet, light, and air were in the kitchen, but outer doors, gentle summer morning everywhere, made him feel a bit packish. The coals were reddening. Another slice of bread and butter. Three, four, right? She didn't like her plate full, right? He turned from the tray, lifted the kettle of the hob, and set it sideways on the fire. It sat there, dull and squat, its spout stuck out. Cup of tea soon, good, mouth dry. The cat walked stiffly round a leg of the table with tail on high. Meow. Oh, there you are, Mr. Bloom said, turning from the fire. The cat mewed in answer and stalked again stiffly round a leg of the table, mewing. Just how she stalks over my writing table. Purr, scratch my head, purr. Mr. Bloom watched curiously, kindly, the lithe black form. Clean to see the gloss of her sleek hide, the white button under the bud of her tail, the green flashing eyes. He bent down to her, his hands on his knees. Milk for the pussins, he said. Meow, the cat cried. They call them stupid. They understand what we say better than we understand them. She understands all she wants to. Vindictive, too. Wonder what I look like to her. Hide of a tower? No, she can jump me. Afraid of the chickens she is, he said mockingly. Afraid of the chook chooks. I never saw such a stupid pussins as the pussins. Cruel, her nature. Curious mice never squeal. Seemed to like it. Meow, the cat said loudly. She blinked up out of her avid, shame-closing eyes, mewing plaintively and long, showing him her milk-white teeth. He watched the dark eye slits narrowing with greed till her eyes were green stones. Then he went to the dresser, took the jug Henlon's milkman had just filled for him, poured warm bubbled milk on a saucer, and set it slowly on the floor. Grr, she cried, running to lap. He watched the bristles shining wirely in the weak light as she tipped three times and licked lightly. Wonder, is it true if you clip them they can't mouse after? Why? They shine in the dark, perhaps the tips. Or kind of feelers in the dark, perhaps. He listened to her licking lap. Ham and eggs. No good eggs with this drought. Want pure fresh water. Thursday. Not a good day either for a mutton kidney at Buckley's. Fried with butter. A shake of pepper. Better a pork kidney at Lugich's. White the kettle is boiling. She lapped slower then licking the saucer clean. Why are their tongues so rough? To lap batter all porous holes. Nothing she can eat? He glanced round him. No. On quietly creaky boots, he went up the staircase to the hall, paused by the bedroom door. She might like something tasty. Thin bread and butter she likes in the morning, still perhaps once in a way. He sat softly in the bare hall. I'm going round the corner. Be back in a minute. And when he had heard his voice say it, he added, You don't want anything for breakfast? A sleepy, soft grunt answered, Hmm. No, she did not want anything. He heard then a warm, heavy sigh, softer, as she turned over and the loose brass quoits of the bedstead jingled. Must get those settled, really. Pity all the way from Gibraltar, forgotten any little Spanish she knew, wonder what her father gave for it, old style. Oh yeah, of course. Bought it at the governor's 
auction. Got a short knock. Hard as nails at a bargain, old Tweety. Yes, sir. At Plevna, that was. I rose from the ranks, sir, and I'm proud of it. Still, he had brains enough to make that corner in stamps. Now that was far-seeing. His hand took his hat from the peg over his initialed heavy overcoat and his lost property office second-hand waterproof. Stamps. Sticky back pictures. Dare say lots of officers are in the swim, too. Course they do. The sweated legend in the crown of his hat told him mutely. Plasto's high-grade haw. He peeped quickly inside the leather handband. Wide slip of paper. Quite safe. On the doorstep, he felt in his hip pocket for the latch key. Not there. In the trousers I left off. Must get it. Potato I have. Creaky wardrobe. No use disturbing her. She turned over sleepily that time. He pulled the hall door. Two after him very quietly. More till the foot leaf dropped gently over the threshold. A limp lid. Looked shut. All right till I come back anyhow. He crossed to the bright side, avoiding the loose cellar flap of number 75. The sun was nearing the steeple of George's church. Be a warm day, I fancy. Especially in these black clothes, feel it more. Black conducts, reflects, refracts, is it? The heat. But I couldn't go in that light suit, make a picnic of it. His eyelids sank quietly, often as he walked in happy warmth. Bolin's bet. Bolin's brethren delivering with trays are daily what she prefers. Yesterday's loaves, turnovers, crisp crowns, hot. Makes you feel young. Somewhere in the east, early morning. Set off at dawn. Travel round in front of the sun. Steal a day's march on him. Keep it up forever. Never grow a day older technically. Walk along a strand. Strange land. Come to a city gate, sentry there, old rank or two, old Tweety's big mustaches leaning on a long kind of a spear. Wander through awned streets, turbaned faces going by. Dark caves of carpet shops, big men, Turkle the terrible, seated cross-legged smoking a coiled pipe. Cries of sellers in the streets. Drink water scented with fennel sherbet. Wander along all day. Might meet a robber or two. Well, meet him. Getting on to sundown. The shadows of the mosques along the pillars. Priest with a scroll rolled up. A shiver of the trees signal the evening wind. I pass on fading gold sky. A mother watches from her doorway. She calls her children home in their dark language. High wall, beyond strings twanged. Night sky moon, violet, color of Molly's new garters. Strings, listen. A girl playing one of these instruments. What do you call them? Dulcimers. I pass. Probably not a bit like it, really kind of stuff you read in the trek of the sun sunburst on the title page he smiled pleasing himself what arthur griffith said about the headpiece over the freeman leader a home rule sun rising up in the northwest from the laneway behind the bank of ireland he prolonged his pleased smile ike touched that home rule sun rising up in the northwest he approached larry o'rourke's from the cellar, grating floated up the flabby gush of porter. Through the open doorway, the bar squirted out whiffs of ginger tea dust biscuit mush. Good house, however, just the end of the city traffic. For instance, Molly's down there, in G.S. position. Of course, if they ran a tram line along the North Circular from the cattle market to the Quays Valley, it would go up like a shot. Bald head over the blind, cute old codger. No use canvassing him for an ad. Still, he knows his own business best. 
There he is, sure enough, my bold Larry, leaning against the sugar bin in his shirt sleeves, watching the apron curate swab up with mop and bucket. Simon Dedalus takes him off to a T with his eyes screwed up. Do you know what I'm going to tell you? What's that, Mr. O'Rourke? Do you know what? The Russians, they'd only be an eight o'clock breakfast for the Japanese. Stop and say a word about the funeral, perhaps. Sad thing about poor Dignan, Mr. O'Rourke. Turning into Dorset Street, he said freshly in greeting through the doorway. Good day, Mr. O'Rourke. Good day to you. Lovely weather, sir. Tis all that. Where do they get the money? Coming up, red-headed curates from the country Leitrim. Rinsing empties an old man in the cellar. Then, lo and behold, they blossom out as Adam Finluters or Dan Talons. Then think of the competition. General thirst. Good puzzle would be cross Dublin without passing a pub. Save it, they can't. Off the drunks, perhaps. Put down three and carry five. What is that? A bob here and there, dribs and drabs, on the wholesale orders, perhaps, doing a double shuffle with the town travelers. Square it with the boss and we'll split the job, see? How much would that tot to off the porter in the month? Say ten barrels is tough. Say he got ten percent off. Oh, more, ten, fifteen, he passed St. Joseph's National School, Brats clamor, windows open, fresh air helps memory. Or a little. A, B, C, D, F, G, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, T, O, V, W. Boys are they? Yes. Inish Turk, Inish Shark, Inish Boffin. At their geography, mine, sleeve bloom. He halted before Lugak's window, staring at the hanks of sausages, polonies, black and white. Fifty multiplied by. The figures whitened in his mind unsolved. Displeased, he let them fade. The shiny links, packed with force meat, fed his gaze, and he breathed in tranquilly the lukewarm breath of cooked, spicy pig's blood. A kidney oozed blood gouts on the willow-patterned dish. The last. He stood by the next-door girl at the counter. Would she buy it, too? calling the items from a slip in her hand, chapped, washing soda, and a pound and a half of Danny sausages. His eyes rested on her vigorous hips. Woods, his name is. Wonder what he does. Wife is oldish. New blood. No followers allowed. Strong pair of arms. Whacking a carpet on the clothesline. She does whack it by George. The way her crooked skirt swings at each whack. The ferret-eyed pork butcher folded the sausages he had snipped off with blotchy fingers, sausage pink. Sound meat there like a stall fat heifer. It took up a page from the pile of cut sheets. The model farm at Kynaret on the lake shore of Tiberias can become ideal winter sanatorium. Moses Montefiore. I thought he was. Farmhouse. Wall round it, blurred cattle cropping. He held the page from him. Interesting. Read it nearer. The blurred cropping cattle. The page rustling. A young white heifer. Those mornings in the cattle market, the beasts, lowing in their pans, branded sheep, flop and fall of dung, the breeders in hobnailed boots trudging through the litter, slapping a palm on a ripe meated hindquarter. There's a prime one, unpeeled switches in their hands. He held the page aslant patiently, bending his senses and his will, his soft subject gaze at rest, the crooked skirt swinging whack by whack by whack. The pork butcher snapped two sheets from the pile, wrapped up her prime sausages, and made a red grimace. Now, my miss, he said. She tendered a coin, smiling boldly, holding her thick wrist out. Thank you, my miss, and one shilling, three pence change. For you, please. Mr. Bloom pointed quickly to catch up and walk behind her if she went slowly behind her moving hams. 
pleasant to see first thing in the morning. Hurry up, damn it. Make hay while the sun shines. She stood outside the shop in sunlight and sauntered lazily to the right. He sighed down his nose. They never understand. Soda chapped hands, crusted toenails too, brown scapulars in tatters defending her both ways. The sting of disregard glowed to weak pleasure within his breast. For another, a constable off duty cuddled her in Eccles Lane. They liked them sizable, prime sausage. Oh, please, Mr. Policeman, I'm lost in the wood. Threepence, please. His hand accepted the moist, tender gland and slid it into a side pocket. Then it fetched up three coins from his trousers pocket and laid them on the rubber prickles. They lay, were read quickly and quickly slid, disc by disc, into the till. Thank you, sir. Another time. A speck of eager fire from fox eyes thanked him. He withdrew his gaze after an instant. No, better not. Another time. Good morning, he said, moving away. Good morning, sir. No sign. Gone. What matter? He walked back along Dorset Street, reading gravely. Egin dach ne dying, planter's company, to purchase vast sandy tracts from Turkish government and plant with eucalyptus trees. Excellent for shade, fuel, and construction. Orange groves and immense melon fields north of Jaffa. You pay eight marks and they plant a dunum of land for you with olives, oranges, almonds, or citrons. Olives cheaper. Oranges need artificial irrigation. Every year you get a sending of the crop. Your name entered for life as owner in the Book of the Union. Can pay ten down and the balance in yearly installments. Bleibt Ruhstrasse, 34, Berlin, West, 15. Nothing doing. Still, an idea behind it. He looked at the cattle, blurred in silver heat. Silvered powdered olive trees, quiet long days, pruning, ripening. Olives are packed in jars, eh? I have a few left from Andrews. Molly spitting them out. Knows the taste of them now. Oranges in tissue paper packed in crates. Citrons too. Wonder is poor Citron still alive in St. Kevin's Parade? And Mestiansky with the old Sither. Pleasant evenings we had then. Molly in Citron's basket chair. Nice to hold. Cool waxen fruit. Hold it in the hand. Lift it to the nostrils and smell the perfume. Like that heavy, sweet, wild perfume. Always the same year after year. They fetched high prices too. Moisel told me. Arbutus place. Pleasant street. Pleasant old times. Must be without a flaw, he said. Coming all that way. Spain, Gibraltar, Mediterranean, the Levant. Crates lined up on the quayside at Jaffa, chap taking them off in a book, navvies handling them in soiled dungarees. There's, what do you call him out of? How do you, doesn't see, chap, you know just a salute bit of a bore. His back is like that Norwegian captain's. Wonder if I'll meet him today watering cart to provoke the rain on earth as it is in heaven a cloud began to cover the sun holy slowly holy gray far no not like that a barren land bare waste volcanic lake the dead sea no fish weedless sunk deep in the earth no wind would lift those waves, gray metal, poisonous foggy waters. Brimstone, they called it, raining down. The cities of the plain, Sodom, Gomorrah, Edom, all dead names. A dead sea in a dead land, gray and old, 
old now. It bore the oldest, the first race, a bent hag cross from Cassidy's clutching a nagging bottle by the neck. The oldest people wandered far away over all the earth, captivity to captivity, multiplying, dying, being born everywhere. It lay there now. Now it could bear no more. Dead, an old woman's, the gray, sunken cunt of the world. Desolation, gray horror seared his flesh. Folding the page into his pocket, he turned into Eccles Street, hurrying homeward. Cold oil slid along his veins, chilling his blood, age crusting him with a salt cloak. Well, I'm here now. Morning mouth bad images. Got up wrong side of the bed. Must begin again those Sandow's exercises. On the hands down. Blotchy brown brick houses. Number 80 still unlet. Why is that? Valuation is only 28. Towers, Battersby, North, MacArthur. Parlor windows plastered with bills, plasters on a sore eye. To smell the gentle smoke of tea, fume of the pan, sizzling butter. Be near her ample bed warmed flesh. Yes, yes. Quick warm sunlight came running from Berkeley Road, swiftly in slim sandals along the brightening footpath. Runs, she runs to meet me, a girl with gold hair on the wind. Two letters and a card lay on the hall floor. He stopped and gathered them. Mrs. Marion Bloom, his quick heart slowed at once, bold hand. Mrs. Marion. Poldy! Entering the bedroom, he half closed his eyes and walked through warm yellow twilight towards her tousled head. Who are the letters for? He looked at them. Mullinger. Millie. A letter for me from Millie, he said carefully, and a card to you, and a letter for you. He laid her card and letter on the twill bedspread near the curve of her knees. Do you want the blind up? Letting the blind up by gentle tugs, halfway his backward eye saw her glance at the letter and tuck it under her pillow. That do? he asked, turning. She was reading the card, propped on her elbow. She got the things, she said. He waited till she had laid the card aside and curled herself back slowly with a snug sigh. Hurry up with that tea, she said. I'm parched. The kettle is boiling, he said. But he delayed to clear the chair, her striped petticoat, tossed soiled linen, and lifted all in an armful onto the foot of the bed. As he went down the kitchen stairs, she called, Poldy! What? Scald the teapot. On the boil, sure enough, a plume of steam from the spout. He scalded it and rinsed out the teapot and put in four full spoons of tea, tilting the kettle, then to let water flow in. Having set it to draw, he took off the kettle and crushed the pan flat on the live coals and watched the lump of butter slide and melt. While he unwrapped the kidney, the cat mewed hungrily against him. Give her too much meat, she won't mouse. Say they won't eat pork. Kosher. Here. He let the blood-smeared paper fall to her and dropped the kidney amid the sizzling butter sauce. Pepper. He sprinkled it through his fingers, ringwise, from the chipped egg cup. Then he slid open his letter, glancing down the page and over. Thanks. New Tam. Mr. Coglin. Lock Ool Picnic. Young Student. Blazes Boylan's Seaside Girls. The tea was drawn. He filled his own mustache cup. Sham Crown Derby. Smiling. 
Silly Millie's birthday gift. Only five she was then. No, wait. Four. I gave her the ambroid necklace she broke. Putting pieces of folded brown paper in the letterbox for her, he smiled, pouring. Oh, Millie Bloom, you are my darling. You are my looking glass from night to morning. I'd rather have you without a farthing than Katie Kioch with her ass and garden. Poor old Professor Goodwin. Dreadful old case. Still, he was a courteous old chap. Old-fashioned way he used to bow Molly off the platform and the little mirror in his silk hat. This night, Millie brought it into the parlor. Oh, look what I found in Professor Goodwin's hat. All we left, sex breaking out even then, pert little piece she was, he prodded a fork into the kidney and slapped it over, then fitted the teapot on the tray. Its hump bumped as he took it up. Everything on it, bread and butter, four, sugar, spoon, her cream, yes. He carried it upstairs, his thumb hooked in the teapot handle. Nudging the door open with his knee, he carried the tray in and set it on the chair by the bedhead. What a time you were, she said. She set the brasses jingling as she raised herself briskly, an elbow on the pillow. He looked calmly down on her bulk and between her large, soft bubs, sloping within her nightdress like a she-goat's udder. The warmth of her couch body rose on the air mingling with the fragrance of the tea she poured. A strip of torn envelope peeped from under the dimpled pillow. In the act of going, he stayed to straighten the bedspread. Who was the letter from? he asked. Bold hand, Marion. Oh, Boylan, she said. He's bringing the program. What are you singing? La Chi Darem with J.C. Doyle she said, and love's old sweet song. Her full lips, drinking, smiled. Rather stale smell that incense leaves next day, like foul flower water. Would you like the window open a little? She doubled a slice of bread into her mouth, asking, What time is the funeral? Eleven, I think, he answered. I didn't see the paper. Following the pointing of her finger, he took up a leg of her soiled drawers from the bed. No? Then a twisted gray garter looped round a stocking, rumpled, shiny sole. No, that book. Other stocking. Her petticoat. It must have fell down, she said. He felt here and there. Volio e non vorrei. Wonder if she pronounces that right. Volio, not in the bed, must have slid down. He stooped and lifted the valence. The book, fallen, sprawled against the bulge of the orange keyed chamber pot. Show here, she said. I put a mark in it. There is a word I wanted to ask you. She swallowed a draft of tea from her cup, held by it not handle, and having wiped her fingertips smartly on the blanket, began to search the tax with the hairpin till she reached the word. Madam what? he asked. Here, she said. What does that mean? He leaned downward and read near her polished thumbnail. Madam Psychosis? Yes. Who's he when he's at home? Madam Psychosis, he said, frowning. It's Greek, from the Greek. That means the transmigration of souls. Oh, rocks, she said. Tell us in plain words. He smiled, glancing askance at her mocking eye. The same young eyes, the first night after the charades, Dolphin's Barn, he turned over the smudged pages. Ruby, the pride of the ring. Hello, illustration. Fierce Italian with carriage whip. Must be Ruby Pride of the on the floor naked. Sheet kindly lent. The monster Maffei desisted and flung his victim from him with an oath. Cruelty behind it all. Doped animals. 
trapeze at anglers. Had to look the other way, mob gaping. Break your neck and we'll break our sides. Families of them. Bone them young so they, madam psychosis, that we live after death, our souls, that a man's soul after he dies, dignum soul. Did you finish it? He asked. Yes, she said. There's nothing smutty in it. Is she in love with the first fellow all the time? Never read it. Do you want another? Yes. Get another of Paul de Cox. Nice name he has. She poured more tea into her cup, watching its flow sideways. Must get that Capel Street library book renewed or they'll write to Carney, my garrender. Reincarnation, that's the word. Some people believe, he said, that we go on living in another body after death that we lived before. They call it reincarnation. That we all lived before on the earth thousands of years ago or some other planet. They say we have forgotten it. Some say they remember their past lives. The sluggish cream wound curdling spirals through her tea. Better remind her of the word, Madame Psychosis. An example would be better. An example. The bath of the nymph over the bed, given away with the Easter number of photo bits. Splendid masterpiece in art colors. Tea before you put milk in. Not unlike her with her hair down. Slimmer. Three and six I gave her the frame. She said it would look nice over the bed. Naked nymphs. Grease. And for instance, all the people that lived then. He turned the pages back. Madame Psychosis, he said, is what the ancient Greeks called it. They used to believe you could be changed into an animal or a tree, for instance. What they called nymphs, for example. Her spoon ceased to stir up the sugar. She gazed straight before her, inhaling through her arched nostrils. There's a smell of bun, she said. Did you leave anything on the fire? The kidney, he cried suddenly. He fitted the book roughly into his inner pocket and, stubbing his toes against the broken commode, hurried out towards the smell, stepping hastily down the stairs with the flurried stork's legs. Pungent smoke shot up in an angry jet from a side of the pan. By prodding a prong of the fork under the kidney, he detached it and turned it, turtle, on its back. Only a little burned. He tossed it off the pan onto a plate and let the scanty brown gravy trickle over it. Cup of tea now. He sat down, cut and buttered a slice of the loaf. He shore away the burnt flesh and flung it to the cat. Then he put a forkful into his mouth, chewing with discernment the toothsome pliant meat. Done to a turn, a mouthful of tea. Then he cut away dyes of bread, sopped one in the gravy and put it in his mouth. What was that about, some young student in the picnic? He creased out the letter at his side, reading it slowly as he chewed, sopping another dye of bread in the gravy and raising it to his mouth. Dearest Pabli, thanks ever so much for the lovely birthday present. It suits me splendid. Everyone says I'm quite the belle in my new Tam. I got Mummy's lovely box of creams and I'm writing. They're lovely. I'm getting on swimming in the photo business now. Mr. Coughlin took one of me and Mrs. will send when developed. We did great biz yesterday. Fair day and all the beef to the heels were in. We're going to Loch Ool on Monday with a few friends to make a scrap picnic. Give my love to mummy and to yourself a big kiss and thanks. I hear them at the piano downstairs. There's to be a concert in the Gravel Arms on Saturday. There's a young student comes here some evenings named Bannon. His cousins or something are big swells. He sings Boylan's. I was on the pop of writing Blaze's Boylan's song about those seaside girls. Tell him Silly Millie sends my best respects. Must now close with fondest love. Your fond daughter. P.S. Excuse bed writing. I'm in a hurry. Bye-bye, Millie. Fifteen yesterday. Curious. Fifteen of the month, too. 
Her first birthday away from home. Separation. Remember the summer morning she was born, running to knock up Mrs. Thornton in Denzel Street. Jolly old woman. Lots of babies she must have helped into the world. She knew from the first poor little Rudy wouldn't live. Well, God's good, sir. She knew at once he would be 11 now if he had lived. His vacant face stared, pitying at the postscript. Excuse bed writing. Hurry, piano downstairs. Coming out of her shell. Row with her in the XL Cafe about the bracelet. Wouldn't eat her cakes or speak or look. Sauce box. He sopped other dies of bread in the gravy and ate piece after piece of kidney. Twelve and a six a week. Not much. Still, she might do worse. Music hall stage, young student. He drank a draft of cooler tea to wash down his meal. Then he read the letter again. Twice. Oh well, she knows how to mind herself. But if not, no, nothing has happened. Of course it might. Wait in any case till it does. A wild piece of goods. Her slim legs running up the staircase. Destiny. Ripening now. Vain. Very. He smiled with troubled affection at the kitchen window. Dea caught her in the street, pinching her cheeks to make them red. Anemic a little. Was given milk too long. On the errands king that day round the kish. Damn old tub pitching about, not a bit funky, her pale blue scarf loose in the wind with her hair. All dimpled cheeks and curls, your head it simply swirls. Seaside girls, torn envelope, hence stuck in his trousers pockets, Jarvie off for the day, singing. Friend of the family, swirls, he says, peer with lamps, summer evening. Band. Those girls, those girls, those lovely seaside girls. Millie, too. Young kisses. The first. Far away now past. Mrs. Marion. Reading, lying back now. Counting the strands of her hair. Smiling. Braiding. A soft qualm regret. Flowed down his backbone, increasing. Will happen, yes. Prevent, useless, can't move. Girls, sweet light lips, will happen too. He felt the flowing qualm spread over him. Useless to move now. Lips kissed, kissing kissed. Full gluey woman's lips. Better where she's down there. Away, occupy her. Wanted a dog to pass the time. Might take a trip down there. August bank holiday. Only two and six return. Six weeks off, however. Might work a press pass or through McCoy. The cat, having cleaned all her fur, returned to the meat-stained paper. Nosed at it and stalked to the door. She looked back at him, mewing. Wants to go out. Wait before a door. Sometime it will open. Let her wait. As the fidgets, electric, thunder in the air, was washing at her ear with her back to the fire too, it felt heavy, full. Then a gentle loosening of his bowels. He stood up, undoing the waistband of his trousers. The cat mewed to him. Yeah. He said in answer, Wait till I'm ready. Heaviness, hot day coming, too much trouble to fag up the stairs to the landing. A paper. He liked to read at stool. Hope no ape comes knocking just as I am. In the table drawer, he found an old number of titbits. He folded it under his armpit, went to the door and opened it. The cat went up in soft bounds. Ah, wanted to go upstairs, curl up in a ball on the bed. Listening, he heard her voice. Come on, pussy, come. He went out through the back door into the garden, stood to listen towards the next garden. No sound. Perhaps hanging clothes out to dry. The maid was in the garden. Fine morning. He bent down to regard a lean file of spearmint growing by the wall. Make a summer house here. Scarlet runners, 
Virginia creepers want to manure the whole place over scabby soil, a coat of liver of sulfur, all soil like that without dung, household slops, loam, what is this that is? The hens in the next garden, their droppings are very good top dressing. Best of all, though, are the cattle, especially when they're fed on those oil cakes. Mulch of dung. Best thing to clean ladies' kid gloves. Dirty cleans. Ashes, too. Reclaim the whole place. Grow peas in that corner there. Lettuce. Always have fresh greens, then. Still gardens have their drawbacks. That bee or blue bottle here with Monday. He walked on. Where's my hat, by the way? Must have put it back on the peg or hanging up on the floor. Funny, don't remember that. Halls tend to full. Four umbrellas, her rain cloak. Picking up the letters, Drago's shop bell ringing. Queer, I was just thinking that moment. Brown, brilliantine hair over his collar. Just had a wash and brush up. Wonder have I time for a bath this morning? Terrace Street. Chap in the pay box there. Got away, James Stevens, they say. O'Brien. Deep voice that fellow Lugax has. Agenda. What is it? Now, my Miz. Enthusiast. He kicked open the crazy door of the Jakes. Better be careful not to get these trousers dirty for the funeral. He went in bowing his head under the low lintel, leaving the door ajar amid the stench of moldy lime wash and stale cobwebs he undid his braces. Before sitting down, he peered through a chink up at the next door window. The king was in his counting house. Nobody. A squat on the cuck stool, he folded out his paper, turning its pages over on his bare knees. Something new and easy. No great hurry. Keep it a bit. Our prize titbit. Matcham's Masterstroke. Written by Mr. Philip Beaufoy. Playgoers Club, London. Payment at the rate of one guinea a column has been made to the writer. Three and a half... Three pounds three, three pounds thirteen, and six. Quietly he read, restraining himself. The first column and, yielding but resisting, began the second. Midway, his last resistance yielding, he allowed his bowels to ease themselves quietly as he read, reading still patiently that slight constipation of yesterday quite gone. Hope it's not too big. Bring on piles again. No, just right. So, ah, cost of one tabloid of Cascara Sagrada. Life might be so. It did not move or touch him, but it was something quick and neat. Print anything now. Silly season. He read on, seated calm above his own rising smell. Neat, certainly. Matcham often thinks of the master stroke by which he won the laughing witch. Who now? Begins and ends morally. Hand in hand. Smart. He glanced back through what he had read, and while feeling his water flow quietly, he envied kindly Mr. Beaufoy, who had written it and received payment of three pounds thirteen and six. Might manage a sketch by Mr. and Mrs. L. M. Bloom. Invent a story for some proverb which... Time I used to try jotting down on my cuff what she said dressing. Disliked dressing together. Nicked myself shaving. Biting her nether lip, hooking the placket of her skirt. Timing her. 9.15. Did Roberts pay you yet? 9.20. What had Greta Conroy on? 9.23. What possessed me to buy this comb? 9.24. I'm swelled after that cabbage, a speck of dust on the patent leather of her boot, rubbing smartly in turn each welt against her stocking calf, morning after the bazaar dance when May's band played Ponchielli's Dance of the Hours. Explain that morning hours, noon, then evening coming on, then night hours. Washing her teeth, that was the first night, her head dancing, 
her fan stick squeaking. Is that Borland well off? He has money. Why? I notice he had a good smell of his breath dancing. No use humming, then. Allude to it. Strange kind of music that last night the mirror was in shadow. She rubbed her hand glass briskly on her woolen vest against her full wagging bob. Peering into it, lines in her eyes, it wouldn't pan out somehow. Evening hours, girls in gray gauze. Night hours then black with daggers and eye masks. Poetical idea, pink, then golden, then gray, then black. Still true to life also. Day, then the night. He tore away half the prize story sharply and wiped himself with it. Then he girded up his trousers, braced, and buttoned himself. He pulled back the jerky, shaky door of the jakes and came forth from the gloom into the air. In the bright light, lightened and cooled in limb, he, he eyed carefully his black trousers, the ends, the knees, the hawks of the knees. What time is the funeral? Better find out in the paper. A creak and a dark whir in the air high up. The bells of George's church. They told the hour loud, dark iron. Quarter two. There again, the overtone following through the air. A third. Poor Dignam 